And I began to prepare for this message several weeks ago because it tends to take me a long time to prepare for a message. And I've determined that it's kind of like preparing a sermon on unity is kind of like praying for patience. You just have to be really careful what you pray for because like praying for patience, you get a lot of opportunities to exercise that. And in praying for this message about unity, I found many opportunities to exercise that very thing. And I have to be real honest with you, I'm not sure that I could give myself a very good grade for that. But let me just show you an example of one of the things. Of course, the the opposite side of unity is division. And so let me just show you. I want to put up a picture of our new puppy. Now, who couldn't love a face like that, right? And the next picture is the mud hole that she dug in our backyard. And the final picture is the result of her playing in that mud hole. When I discovered what she had done, there was not a lot of unity between me and the puppy. It, be, it caused quite a divisive thing between she and I for a number of hours. So I had to uh, exercise some patience, a garden hose bath, and we're back on good terms, but my grass may never be the same. But So I, I, in, in talking about unity, if you've been in church very long, you understand that churches are no different than a lot of other relationships, families, uh, marriages, friendships, that sometimes division comes into those. And it's not always easy to have unity in those things. Well, some of the common things that you may have heard about for, that churches have had division about, things like the color of the carpet, the color of the walls, the temperature in the sanctuary. Rhonda and I can't even agree on the temperature in our house, much less how we get 200 people to agree on the temperature in the sanctuary. Other things might be more significant, but we often find things are divisive. Tom Rainier is a CEO of ChurchAnswers.com. A number of years ago, he asked his Twitter followers to send him what they consider to be some of the most ridiculous arguments and church splits that they were aware of. Some of his favorites were this. Big discussion, big argument between the church on whether to install restroom stall dividers in the ladies' restroom. Does that even need to be a discussion? Another one was, this group over here was unhappy about this group who was in charge of the Lord's Supper because this group used cran grape juice instead of grape juice. Now, we all would agree that it has to be grape juice because it says that in Hezekiah 13.22, and you can look that up later. Um, Let me know how that goes for you. Another church had great discussion and argument over the term, whether to use the term pot luck versus pot blessing. You see, one group thought if you use the term luck, you were questioning God's sovereignty. Another group discussed whether or not they should allow people to wear black shirts to church because black is the color of the devil which frankly is news to me. I thought the devil was red, but that's a different issue. Then finally, the church discussed at great length whether they should allow deviled eggs at their pot blessing. (laughs) Well, I think the solution to that is very simple. If you're going to allow deviled eggs at your pot blessing, you just finish it up with angel food cake for dessert. (laughs) Should balance it out. But you know that churches are not the only places where division happens. Happens in families, happens in all relationships. It's just not easy 
to always have unity. Rhonda's, my wife's uh, dad, just passed away about a month ago, and so we've been back and forth to Lubbock, uh, taking care of the funeral, and then those of you who have been through something like that, you know you get to a time where you've got to do something with the house and the stuff. And so you, you get to that time where you're divvying up the stuff. And to Rhonda and her two sisters' credit, they had no fights, no discussions, no arguments, no division about the stuff. But while I was down there, a friend of mine was sharing that his mother, actually when his grandmother died, she was in California, so his mother, who was in Texas, went to California for the funeral and the divvying up the stuff. Well, his mother had her eye on one thing that had been her mother's, and it was a trinket. When she, when she got to California, she discovered that one of the other sisters had taken that trinket and had no desire to give that up. Well, the result of that particular incident was that the Texas side of the family didn't speak to the California side of the family for 25 years. Now, we would probably agree that those examples of things in churches that I've just given you, and even that example, when we're not the ones involved in it, think those are pretty petty things to be divisive about. Well, this morning, I want to talk to you about division and unity. God's Word has a lot to say about that. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 10, go through uh, verse 13. But let me just give you a little bit of background. If you're familiar with Paul's letters to the church at Corinth, both 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians are letters to a troubled church. You see, the church at Corinth was arguing about a lot of things, a lot of things that we would call preferences. Not essentials to the faith, just preferences. You see, they were arguing about things like whether a Christian should be able to eat meat offered to idols. They were arguing about should Christians even marry. They were arguing about this group that was showing off their spiritual gifts claiming to be more spiritual than this group. They were taking each other to court. And they were arguing over one group choosing to follow one Christian leader, another group choosing a different Christian leader. And it was causing conflict and division. So in verse 10, Paul says this, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, your translation, translation may be a little bit different. It may say, I beseech you, I exhort you, I beg you, I urge you, I plead with you. But whatever version you have, it's clear to me that Paul is serious about this. He is, he is beseeching, he's pleading, he's begging for them to do these things. A number of years ago, a friend of mine uh, went to our administrative pastor, it's a different church, and asked for a, a room and a time where a particular Bible study could meet. And after several requests and several weeks of not getting an answer on that, my friend caught this pastor in between services out in the foyer. There's people all over the place. And my friend gets down in front of the pastor. He's down on his knees and he says, I beg you, I beg you, please give us a time and a room that we can meet. Well, he had it by the end of the next service. But you see... When people are begging and pleading with you, it's generally a serious matter. And I believe Paul was serious here. He goes on and says, that he goes on in that verse, he addresses the church at Corinth as brothers. I think that's significant. You see, he wants to remind us that we're all in Christ's family here. Brothers and sisters in Christ. And because of that, we should be unified. There should not be petty divisions in a family. We're brothers and sisters, and we should love and care for each other. He goes on then and says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Paul was stating that I'm not coming here on my own accord. I'm coming here under the authority and on behalf of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Note there, I think this is really important as well. Paul did not say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Another implication, another reminder that we're family. We're all in this together. Paul kind of ups his game, if you will, because he says, he says those words, and then he goes on and he says that all of you would agree with one another so that there may be no division among you. The Greek word for divisions is schismata. It's where we get our word schism. And that's not a word that I bet none of you have used that word this week. Uh, but your parents and grandparents probably use that word a lot. And it really means tears or divisions. Uh, we, we would just think of it more as a split or a division among two strongly opposed groups. It's a serious word and it carries serious consequences with it. Now Paul continues and he says, that you might be perfectly united in mind and thought. What Paul is really asking for here is that there be no gossip, no backbiting, no unforgiveness, no bitterness among us, the family of Jesus Christ. In verses 11 and 12, Paul says, My brothers, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Well, it would seem that we kind of have a whistleblower in Chloe's house. But not necessarily in a bad way. You see, this person in Chloe's household recognized what was going on in the church. They recognized the divisions that were happening in the church. And rather than gossip about it, rather than create more issues, this individual went to the person that they felt could do something about it. They went directly to Paul. And I might add that that person did not go anonymously, which is often the case. We kind of like to... Some of us kind of like to say, well, here's what's wrong with the church, but we don't want to know, we don't want the pastor to know who, who said that. I think that's a wrong way to handle that. Uh, this person in Chloe's household was bold enough to go to the right person to try to get this fixed. Now, in this church in Corinth, they were divided over which leader to follow. Some followed Paul, and those were probably the people that had been in the church since the beginning. Others followed Apollos because he was an eloquent, sophisticated speaker, much like me. There's no amen in that. Others said they followed Cephas or Peter. And those were probably the, the Jews that were kind of lamenting the loss of their traditions. And while others gave the right answer and said, we follow Christ, in this particular setting, it was probably more of those folks who thought themselves more spiritual than everybody else. So let me give you just a, a modern day example of what that would look like. If I was to ask you to stand, and I, I'm not, but if I was to ask you to stand and said, all of you who prefer Brian's preaching, go over here. There might be a handful of you. And then if I said, all of you who prefer my preaching, go over here and good luck finding a seat. But then, you know, that's not true. But then if I said, this group over here, my group, I want you to criticize those who are following Brian's preaching. And Brian might say, no, no, my group, you need to tell this group how wrong they are for following Terry's preaching. That's the kind of thing that was going on there in the church of Corinth. I was reminded of a church that literally split. Uh, and you find examples of this, unfortunately, all over the place. But there, this particular church split over who the real pastor was. There were two of them. And so one Sunday morning, they both got up to lead worship. This group trying to outsing this group, and this group trying to sing louder than that group. 
And then these pastor got up and began preaching two totally different messages at the same time. This guy trying to preach louder than this guy. And this guy trying to emphasize his point louder than the other one. Well, that ended in a fist fight between the pastors. And the police had to come and break that up. What a testimony. But that's what we do when division creeps into our body. Paul kind of sarcastically, in my mind, says in verse 13, is Christ divided? The answer is no. Christ is not divided. Christ is our example, and we're all one in Christ. Central truth I have for you today is this. Christ calls for the church to be bound together in unity. Now, let me be clear. What Paul is speaking to here are preferences, not essentials of the faith. We're to be united in the essentials of the faith. And if you're in a situation where someone is teaching or preaching heresy, or teaching or preaching things that are contrary to God's word, that is not a preference. That is a serious issue, and it needs to be dealt with quickly and decisively. But that's not what was happening here. So we're talking about preferences. Now, Paul doesn't expect us to all be robots and think the same way and give up our individual identities to kind of be, I don't know if some of you might remember, there was a, a television show or it might have been a movie years and years ago called The Stepford Wives. And it seemed like they injected something into these wives and they were just pretty robotic, you know. That's not what Paul's asking us to do. He's asking us to be united on essentials and show grace and mercy to others on the preferences. Now, some of you may be thinking, wait a minute. I thought we were studying Revelation. What are we doing here in 1 Corinthians in this passage? Well, there's two reasons for that. One is I'm a chicken and I didn't want to take on Revelation. And the other is that because we're studying Revelation, we have great opportunity for division. But we have greater opportunity for unity. Brian has been very intentional to lay out the essentials that we're studying in Revelation. And those essentials are this, the infallibility of the biblical author's account of the end times, the literal return of Christ, Christ's victory over Satan and all that opposed him. Believers' eternal union and reign with Christ. Unbelievers' eternal separation from Christ without hope of salvation. Those are the essentials of Revelation. And we should agree and be united in those essentials. The preferences of Revelation, the non-essentials, if you will, where we're to exhibit liberty and charity are the rapture, the millennium, the role of Israel, the nature and identity of key figures like the Antichrist and the two witnesses, and the timing and sequence of events. Those are the non-essentials, the preferences that we're to exhibit liberty and charity toward those who may not share the same view as you. I like what Tony Evans says he paints a picture of liberty, and he says this, An orchestra is unified. Everyone performs on the same instrument. Not, let me start that over. An orchestra is unified not because everyone performs on the same instrument, but because everyone harmoniously plays the same song under the direction of the conductor. Likewise, the church is to be unified not because every Christian is exactly alike, but because we all pledge allegiance to the same Lord. Now, the truth of the matter is, folks, that this church, every other church, every relationship, whether it be business, marriage, friendships, is made up of imperfect people. And we bring our imperfections with us. And sometimes 
those cause conflicts. It causes divisions. And so it's not a matter of if you find yourself in a situation of conflict. It's more a matter of when you find yourself in a situation of conflict. I have a couple of suggestions for you. The first one is this. Work through the conflict quickly. Now, you may need some time to pray about it, to seek God's will, how you pr proceed with that, but don't delay and delay and delay. It just festers. It gets bigger than it ought to be. Try to resolve the conflict quickly. The second thing is work to understand what essentials versus preferences are and learn to appreciate the differences in your preferences. It's been said, to live above with saints we love will certainly be glory. To live below with saints we know, that's a different story. Unity among Christians is essential. And the third thing is this. Remember who and what unites us. It's the love of Jesus Christ. It's the salvation that he has provided for us that unites us. David Jeremiah says, talking about this passage in 1 Corinthians, he says, where does one begin with a contentious, out-of-balance, problem-filled church? Well, deep in his letter, Paul seems to set aside this long list of church problems to write about agape love. You see, whenever there are problems in a church, a marriage, or any other significant relationship, the first thing to slip out the back door is timeless, self-sacrificial love. That's the love that Jesus modeled. See, when Jesus wrote his own letter to the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2, he complimented the church on their great theology, their accurate doctrine, their hard work, but he also had one thing against them. And if you recall, it was that they had lost their first love. God's love and joy and our salvation that he provided should unite us. Jesus' own words in John 13, 35 says, All men will know you are my disciples by, by the way you fight with each other, by the way you argue with each other, by the way you criticize each other, and by the way you treat each other poorly. If that's what your Bible says, you should rip that page out and throw it away. Because that's not what he says. He says, All men will know you are my disciples if you love one another. I think some people feel like they have a calling to be the chief critic of the church. They're willing to point out all the things that are wrong. And, and in my experience, they're often willing to tell you how it should be done. You're doing it wrong here. This is how you should be, it should be done. I don't find that calling or that gifting in my Bible. What I often find is that people who feel that way, that they're called to be the chief critic, most of the time what they're talking about are their preferences, not necessarily God's Word. When I was a teenager, actually I was probably, are you a teenager when you're in junior high? Anyway, when I was in junior high, my, my family moved to a new town where my dad was going to take over as the pastor of the First Baptist Church. We had been in, in town for about two weeks, and one of the deacons from the church showed up at my house and had a conversation with my mother. His conversation was this, God has called me to make sure that no pastor stays at this church more than three years. My dad was there for 12 years, and, and gratefully, I can report to you that over the, the last number of those years, this gentleman had changed his mind, changed his approach, changed his heart. But you see, there's an attitude there that says, God's appointed me to make, create an environment to make it as difficult on you as I can. Again, I do not find that in my, my Bible. Many of you have heard me say this before, that I would love 
for a critical judgmental spirit to be added to the fruit list of the fruit of the spirit found in Galatians 5? I've lobbied for that for a long time because that's something I'm really good at. It's not getting added. It's not there and it's not going to be there. You see, that kind of attitude is dangerous and it promotes division. It promotes division among families, churches, friendships, business relationships, all kinds of relationships. It also seems to me that people who have that critical, divisive attitude share some similar traits. I think some of those traits are they lack humility. They tend to look out for their own best interest only. They're argumentative and show little gentleness. They're impatient with everyone except themselves. And they insist on things being done their way. So my prayer for you today is that if you recognize these attitudes, I pray that it's not while you're looking in the mirror. Here's a question that you should ask yourself or perhaps ask someone close to you on your behalf. Am I a uniter or am I a divider? I believe there's a universal threat to unity in our churches these days and frankly other areas of our life as well. And that universal threat is this. The tendency to elevate our personal agendas over God's agenda. And by way of application, let me give you four ways that I believe that we can begin to overlook the petty differences about non-essentials. The first thing would be this. Be single-minded in purpose. The purpose of our lives is to serve Christ. Christ. Philippians 1.21 says, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. The second way we can overlook petty differences is to adopt God's priorities as our own. God first, other second, you third. Philippians 2, 5, and 7 says, Your attitude should be the same of that, as that of Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. And the third thing is to keep moving forward spiritually. Keep growing. You may need to acknowledge that you have not arrived spiritually, spiritually yet. You may not have all the right answers. Keep pressing forward to know God more. Now, when I talk about moving forward, I believe that sometimes in order to move forward, you have to take care of some of the stuff back here. Something that might be holding you back from moving forward could be unforgiveness for someone who had hurt you. Be willing to release them from the wrong that they've done to you. You may also need to go back and ask someone to forgive you for something wrong that you have done to them. Sometimes that blocks us from moving forward. Philippians 3, 13 and 14 says, Brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forget what is behind and strain toward what is ahead. And the fourth thing is this. Have a rejoicing mind. You may not be able to celebrate in all circumstances. You may not be able to have joy in all circumstances. But you can always rejoice in God's love and His salvation. You can always rejoice in the love that we share in the family of Christ. Philippians 4, 4 and 5 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say again, rejoice let your gentleness be evident to all. You see, failure to keep unity in our churches 
cripples the cause of Christ. Failure to keep unity in our relationships cripples our testimony. Well, being concerned about the rise of denominations in the church, John Wesley tells of a dream that he had. And in this dream, he was ushered to the gates of hell. Standing there, he yelled out the question, are there any Presbyterians there? The answer was yes. Are there any Baptists there? The answer was yes. Are there any Episcopalians? Are there any Methodists there? The answer came back, yes, yes. He was greatly disturbed by that. So in the dream, he was then ushered to the gates of heaven. And he asked the same questions. And each time he asked the question, the answer came back, no, no. Finally, he said, then who dwells within? And the answer came back, there are only Christians here. Folks, unity is essential to the family of God. I'm going to ask Dave to come up and close us. I want to lead us in a word of prayer. We will have a time of, of response. If, if there's something you would like someone to pray with you about, you can come do that here. We have Dave and Ann Claudic be in the back to be happy to pray with you. It could be something today's message or anything else we just want to pray with you and give you an opportunity to connect in that way so if you would stand with me and i'll pray father we're so grateful for your love grateful for your son jesus i pray that we would never forget the joy of our salvation the depth of what you have done for us sinners that we were that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins so that we could spend eternity in heaven with you. And Father, I pray that while we are here on earth, we will be united in purpose, united in the essentials of our faith, and not let petty preferences divide us and damage our testimony about what you have done for us. Thank you, Lord, for your love for your care, for your grace and mercy. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.